everyone, and welcome to the Hopkinton Center for the Arts' very first in-person event since March of last year. We are so excited to have you all here, to have everyone uh, tuning in from home, and super excited to be starting a brand new series, a lecture series, which we haven't done before. It's something we've always wanted to do since we opened the center. And we are so grateful to uh, our friends at Atlas Wealth Management because they have believed in this project for quite a while. We actually had talked about doing something like this before all this craziness happened. And so, John and Michelle, thank you for your um, belief in us and in this and supporting such a wonderful program. Uh, we are also thrilled. We've been talking for a long time to have our good friend and our favorite architect, Scott Richardson, here to talk about the amazing work that he's doing in climate change and, and helping us to understand what's happening in our world. So, without further ado, and also one more thank you to HCAM for being here tonight. Thank you so much for being here and spreading the word. Um, so, without uh, further ado, we want to introduce our incredible speaker, Mr. Scott Richardson. Welcome, Thank you, Kelly. Uh, that's a nice introduction. Thank you, uh, everyone, for attending, both in person and virtually. Uh, great to be here on this uh, 51st Earth Day uh, to talk about climate reality and uh, what has been happening that's not so good, what needs to happen to help us solve this problem, because it is a problem, it is a crisis, and uh, look forward to sharing some information that I've learned. I was fortunate enough to attend uh, uh, three days of training in August of 2019 uh, with Al Gore's Climate Reality Project team, and uh, learned a lot about what's happening around the world, and they garner a lot of information on a daily basis and share that with uh, people that have taken the, the course and also provide us with updated information and slides to share. So uh, basically we're gonna kind of go through where we are now in the world, where we could be going, uh, where we need to be going, uh, who is doing uh, some things to help right the, the issues that we have, and uh, some of the future goals. So this is uh, again kind of a standard uh, photo that uh, Al always starts his presentations with, uh, the blue marble, uh, taken in 1972 uh, from the Apollo crew. Uh, again, kind of the first photo that uh, shows the world and uh, essentially kind of talks about the fragility of what we have. Uh, again, we have an atmosphere that really supports our life here on Earth. It's really only about 10 miles thick that covers the whole Earth. And basically, we rely on that atmosphere to, again, allow solar radiation to come in to warm the planet, uh, provide us with uh, sunlight for growing and uh, warming. And uh, also, we rely on it to have it radiate back out excess heat. Uh, unfortunately, as we move, have moved through the industrial ages and have burned more and more fossil fuels. Uh, we are trapping more of this uh, heat in our atmosphere. Uh, so consequently, we are, we have increased the overall temperature of the Earth one, one degree centigrade thus far. And the largest source of all of this is the burning of fossil fuels. Uh, so you can see from the early 1900s to today, uh, what the impact is of uh, that uh, burning. So, as a statistic, uh, 152 million tons of global warming is polluted into our atmosphere every day. Um, we're familiar with a lot, with all of the sources of greenhouse gases, uh, industrial agriculture, uh, industrial uh, processes, uh, again, unfortunately, a lot of the tropical Rainforests are being burned for a variety of reasons. Uh, we have coal plants, um, coal mining, fertilization, and transportation, and again, just uh, buildings, uh, the, the occupate, occupancy of buildings and systems. Um, the U.S. Uh, right now is uh, producing 
uh, about 11% of their energy, of our energy that we use by renewable sources. And that includes solar, wind, hydro, uh, and other renewable sources. So that's, that's a, uh, a big step forward. We really want to start to eliminate uh, coal, uh, petroleum, and natural gas as energy sources. Uh, our energy use is uh, in kind of this setup. Uh, the industrial sector, including industrial agriculture, is the biggest user of energy, uh, followed by transportation. Uh, our residential sector is at about 21%, and the commercial sector is about 18%. Um, some, another chart that we're, we really should not be proud of is our energy consumption per capita. We are by far the highest users of energy in the world. Uh, the FSU category is actually the uh, Soviet Union uh, s countries that uh, uh, are a result of the breakup of Russia. But certainly the, uh, to have the world average down around a little over 50 uh, or 60 uh, gigajoules per capita, and we're up over 300 is, uh, is again, a, uh, an indication that we are over consumers. Uh, a lot of countries want to emulate our lifestyle, but it's coming with a price. So an interesting uh, chart that kind of indicates that, you know, a lot of uh, kind of climate deniers will say, well, climate change is uh, the way things are. We understand that. Uh, over the millennia, we are tracking uh, the carbon in the atmosphere, we're tracking temperatures. So there is a fluctuation, uh, as you can see, over the past million years. Uh, but again, the carbon content uh, of the Earth uh, and the Earth's atmosphere and, uh, has really ranged between 180 and 280 parts per million. Um, we are now at about a uh, factor of about 420 parts per million uh, and essentially we are seeing the impact of that uh, with uh, ice melt, uh, sea level rise and other related aspects that I'll get into. If we do nothing uh, to mitigate this in about 40 years we're going to see an increase to about 600 parts per million which would have devastating impact uh, around the world. So some other diagrams that uh, kind of indicate the increase in temperature around the world and how that affects uh, other uh, aspects of our atmosphere. So as we go through the 80s and 90s, we see that tempers are shift, temperatures, summer temperatures are shifting. Uh, we're getting more extremely hot weather uh, and less cooler than average weather. Uh, so here we are, extreme temperatures now uh, cover over 14.5% of the Earth versus 0.1%. Uh, so what is the uh, impact of that? So again, we have uh, very good data that shows the average temperatures are ever increasing every year, and 2020 uh, will be the new hottest year ever. Uh, we're trending probably to 2021 being the same, although you wouldn't know it today. Um, so 19 of the 20 hottest years have, been, have occurred since 20, 2001. And again, the last five years have been extremely hot as we've all known. Uh, in 2018, uh, I don't have updated records on this, but again, 224 locations around the world set all time heat records. Uh, Again, if people were out in the uh, Midwest or down in Florida over the summer, they experienced hottest uh, temperatures ever. Uh, we all heard about the extreme heat waves and uh, fi uh, fires in Australia over their summer. Um, temperatures in Canberra, 111 degrees on January 4th. Uh, portions of Africa and Europe also ex uh, experienced extreme heat over the past several years. And uh, in Siberia, uh, an area reached 100 degrees Fahrenheit last June. Uh, that's in the Arctic. So uh, any guesses what these guys are doing in May uh, in Pakistan? Anyone? 
What's that? Thinking water wise? Well, that's, what, that's a good guess. That's what most people think. Uh, but in fact, they're digging graves for the people they're anticipating will succumb to the extreme heat when it gets into the midsummer. Um, again, if, they were, if there was water to be had uh, digging that way, they would, have, uh, they would have appreciated that. Again, in 2018, we had a temperature of, at the North Pole that was 50 degrees above average. Um, and again, as we were talking earlier, uh, most of the Earth, 75 plus percent of it, is covered with water. So the, the oceans are a big heat sink of this additional heat that we're, gen that we're receiving, uh, which means, again, that ocean temperatures rise and have a negative impact on life in the ocean and also have an impact on the storms as they are forming over the oceans, such as cyclones, hurricanes, typhoons, which then indicate that they can become more deadly. Uh, again, another example of uh, conditions in Greenland where it's really hard to do a dog sled race on water. <laughs> so we're pretty familiar with the uh, cycle of uh, evaporation, precipitation, and then uh, water returning to the sea. So uh, again, as temperatures increase, oceans evaporate more moisture into the sky. The sky is, is the air is much more laden with uh, with water, so we end up with uh, heavier storms, uh, longer lasting storms, and also storms that move very slowly. And we saw that on several hurricanes over the past few years. Um, and here we had a very rare occurrence of two tandem storms last August in the Caribbean. Again, the damage from uh, these storms, again, Haiti has, uh, we've seen all the, the footage from uh, the storms in the Caribbean over the past couple of years, it's just devastating. Um, so hurricanes, again, warmer oceans lead to more intense hurricanes. Hurricanes intensify more rapidly. Uh, they hold more moisture, so they have heavier downpours. And again, storm surges are higher. So Harvey was a perfect example of that. Unfortunately, it uh, progressed towards, towards Houston and then just hovered there for days, uh, drenching Houston and the areas around it um, and um, intensified to a Category 4 hurricane in just two days. It also intensified in the 12 hours before landfall, which is unusual. Uh, the amount of rain that fell across Houston and the whole area was uh, phenomenal. Uh, one community received over five feet of rain. Uh, again, the impact there, again, Texas, a big petrochemical uh, area as long, along with uh, Louisiana. So again, whenever we have flooding, we have toxic chemical releases. And again, unfortunately, those impact uh, low-income low and minority communities more than any other community. Uh, back in May, about a, a year ago, we, uh, there was a super cyclone in uh, India and Bangladesh. You can just kind of see the size of this uh, storm, and it directly affected an area called the Sundarbans, uh, which basically devastated the whole area. Um, there's, again, I don't know what the latest air, uh, news is from there, but they're probably still trying to figure out what to do. Again, with these storms, major storms, whether they're uh, uh, land-based or water or over the ocean or come in over islands we have uh, refugees we have uh, evacuation camps and then we have COVID uh, on top of that during the past year um, so the accumulated record-breaking precipitation anomalies uh, are ever increasing and even more so over the past 15 years uh, some of these uh, the Storms that you see, some of the photography that you see on some of these storms is incredible. Uh, you have these uh, supercell uh, storm bombs. This one I think is in Montana. There was another uh, one very similar to this right over Phoenix uh, over the past couple of years. So these create incredible downpours of rain in concentrated areas. Over the past two years, uh, farming areas have been uh, impacted negatively. Certainly, as these communities have, we've seen torrential flooding in uh, the East Coast as well, up in New Jersey, New York, uh, Carolina.
Carolinas, Louisiana. Uh, and then of course in 2012, we had uh, Hurricane Sandy that uh, was in, uh, uh, unanticipated severity of that. Uh, you saw photographs of Manhattan totally blacked out. So back in the late 1800s, the risk of having a storm like Sandy was one in 500 years. Uh, they basically, after that happened, they kind of re-evaluated what their uh, anticipation is. They're thinking they could get a storm like uh, Hurricane Sandy every 25 years. And forward, uh, fast forward, maybe in 10 years, if we continue to have some uh, global warming activity, uh, you could see storms like that once every five years. Again, a lot of these communities along the coast, Texas, Cal Cal uh, California, are vulnerable to disasters. And unfortunately, again, a lot of these low-lying areas are going to negatively in affect uh, minority uh, populations uh, on average. So in 2019, incredible flooding in our uh, corn belt, wheat belt area, uh, farms that produce uh, most of the, a lot of the crops that we enjoy on a daily basis. Uh, this is in 2018, uh, agricultural town and surrounding area in Iowa, and exact, essentially one year later, uh, totally uh, inundated. Uh, farmers could not grow their crops. Uh, there was a huge uh, bailout for those farmers that really could not generate any income because of flooding. <clears throat> so statistic here we are seeing these types of rainfall and floods four times more often than uh, just 40 years ago um, again we've seen on the news uh, the uh, monsoons in India and other areas uh, are extreme uh, in China in Africa uh, in fact there's an area in uh, Kenya that uh, is near the confluence of three different lakes and a community there has been totally flooded uh, and, is on, and everybody has had to leave that community. Uh, even here in Massachusetts, uh, and of course where else would you have a sign that says wicked high tides? Uh, we have seen those over the past few years, um, both in, in Boston, Chelsea, Lynn, uh, New Bedford, Fall River, uh, and, and again a few years ago we had, uh, I, th I think it was what, two years ago, uh, three flooding events in January in, uh, in the waterfront district. Um, so it is happening, it's happening around us. Um, and we have a video here of Endicott, uh, I think this is in uh, Illinois, where again, extreme rainfall uh, basically diverted a river right through this main street. So the, the other phenomenon is we have these extreme rainfalls uh, in areas that are prone to having such rainfalls and it's exacerbated by the extra heat in the atmosphere, the extra water that's in the atmosphere. But the same, the same evaporation also draws moisture out of adjacent land area that maybe is not uh, prone to getting as much uh, water for growing crops and so on, so that results in droughts. So you have this odd uh, situation where the same evaporation causes flooding in one area and droughts uh, in others. Uh, so this past summer, groundwater levels in Europe were alarmingly low. Uh, we had uh, areas in Poland and the Czech Republic that saw uh, droughts that they hadn't seen in 100 or 500 years. Uh, this is a reservoir in India which dried up completely. Uh, we have been dealing with water scarcity around the world for, for decades and now it affects more than 40% of the world's population. So along with hot, hotter temperatures, we have fires. And uh, we've all witnessed uh, the devastation of the fires uh, primarily in California. Um, in August, there were more than 360 wildfires burning at one time in California. Uh, we saw the devastation, the death and destruction and devastation of multiple fires in California over the past few years. 
Uh, Australia had uh, horrendous fires uh, in December and January of this past year. Um, the staggering loss of uh, animal life was, uh, they had estimated they lost over a billion animals in those fires, as well as uh, houses and, uh, and other destruction. Uh, in South America, the loss of the uh, tropical rainforest is devastating on many fronts. Uh, some of these are you know, from lightning strikes, but a lot of it has to do with land clearing to plant non-indigenous crops. Uh, just expansion of cities and towns. Uh, and again, we have a tropical rainforest which has sequestered so much carbon uh, that once that it is not there anymore, it's releasing the carbon that it is, that it was sequestering and also the soil then is dug up and releases more carbon. So we have situations where the burning uh, and destruction of uh, tropical rainforest is uh, a twofold uh, devastation. Again, Paradise, uh, California's fire, fires in Greece and Korea, uh, around the world. Uh, again, we are at one degree of warming already, so we are looking at the phenomenon of lightning strikes actually increasing 10 to 12 percent, so you'll see more uh, forest fires started by lightning. So the accumulation of these worldwide extreme weather uh, uh, catastrophes, uh, Droughts, fires, floods, mudslides, extreme storms is ever increasing. So they're saying uh, there's parts of India, actually, not only Middle East, North Africa, and India that they're, they're predicting will not be able to be inhabited because of either drought or flooding, or again, if they have droughts, they can't grow crops. Uh, so you're looking at, again, climate uh, instability, food insecurity. And that's why we're seeing a lot of migrants coming from Central America because the whole Central America area, Honduras and other in Nicaragua and those areas are now dubbed the dry corridor. Uh, so they're not able to grow crops. They can't feed themselves. So they're moving uh, northward uh, to Mexico and ultimately uh, to America. So some staggering statistics that uh, again, if climate change uh, continues along these fronts uh, and we have the devastation to our ecosystem, to our uh, agricultural areas, you could see a billion climate migrants. And of course now we have uh, ma major ice loss in Antarctica and the Arctic in Greenland, uh, which is unfolding at a rapid rate. rate. We're all seeing, uh, you know, uh, NOVA and other uh, programs uh, the devastation and melting of these uh, glaciers. Uh, so this is a glacier in uh, Greenland, in picture in 1935. Uh, the same area today is uh, a lake. Uh, the latest statistic on Greenland's ice is melting four times faster than originally thought. So again, we are having sea level rise. A lot of these cities around the world are dealing with this. Uh, Miami is one, New York City, uh, Boston. It has a uh, program for, called uh, Living with Water where they are looking at uh, designing uh, movable uh, dams and dikes as well as in New York, they have several programs where they're both on the Hudson River and the uh, East River. Uh, anything that's built near the, the rivers have to incorporate uh, parks and uh, vegetation and areas that will absorb uh, water rise and then when it retreats you still have uh, a functioning area so then everything else is elevated. Um, the previous chart talked about populations at risk, uh, top 10 cities, a lot of those were in uh, China and uh, India, but uh, Miami and the New York, uh, Newark area are two of the top three uh, cities that have assets in the trillions of dollars that could be negatively affected by sea level rise. Uh, Miami, they're, they're raising roads and building uh, protection against sea level rise right now. Again, talked about New York already. Um, so basically we approach a two degree uh, increase in temperature 
uh, we could be looking at over 12 million. And I think that is a conservative figure. Uh, could lose their homes due to sea level rise. Those of you who uh, have places along the coast or go to the Cape or Maine or other areas have seen, again, some of the devastation that some of these large storms have caused uh, along the North Shore as well. So Kiribati is a uh, archipelago uh, series of islands in the South Pacific. It is actually the first nation in the world that has now purchased land in another country to house its climate refugees because they anticipate within 10 years their, their series of islands where they live will not be in existence. So we have food and water shortages, pandemic, diseases, refugees, climate refugees, uh, again, lack of resources and destruction by natural res uh, disasters. Uh, interesting chart here uh, because, again, the increase in temperature and carbon um, impacts food uh, and food, uh, the growing of food, the delivery of food. Um, so this chart uh, is, is pretty interesting because it, each band uh, represents about five years. Uh, so you could see on the left side um, that North America, South America, about half of Europe is always um, producing a surplus of food and are able to export that uh, and help feed the world. Australia too has a su food surplus based on its consumption. But then as you move to the right, again, Central America, which I chatted about earlier, Africa, Western Europe, most of Africa and Asia are in a food deficit. Uh, they do not produce enough food to feed uh, their populations. And as we end up with global warming, we have an impact of crops yield less and kind of a, a, an estimate of the decline for each one degree of centigrade of the decline in production. The other phenomenon is as temperatures increase, the actual protein content of these staples, which basically provide two thirds of our intake around the world, also decline. So you have uh, a twofold impact uh, of declining yields and declining protein. So again, we will be seeing more climate, uh, if, uh, food security, um, refugees, and this was something that was stated about six years ago. Um, so we're just starting to pay attention to some of this stuff. So as climate warms, uh, temperatures get warmer. Uh, we've all experienced you know, the increase in uh, summer temperatures over the past few years. Uh, tropical diseases typically are in the tropics along the equator. Uh, so again, as temperatures warm, these diseases start to migrate and are moving towards the poles. Um, so you'll, you'll be seeing more of these types of diseases uh, in areas that were never, never experienced them before. We also, again, all these uh, diseases like warmer weather, warmer water, and the more that those temperatures expand uh, north and south from the equator, these diseases will move with them. So we're also, uh, again, on uh, ever going expansion, ever construction, uh, both uh, you know, anywhere in the world, China especially, the amount of construction that they are doing on a regular basis is, is frightening. Uh, and again, same in South America. So again, we're building air into areas that were never uh, occupied uh, before uh, and uncovering infectious diseases. And case in point two, we're basically looking at diseases that are transmitted from animals to humans, uh, which we are witnessing right now with COVID around the world. And then we have air pollution, which is exacerbated uh, by the burning of fossil fuels and by the rise in temperature. Uh, we have deaths, ongoing deaths from air pollution, which are being, again, exacerbated, as I just mentioned. Uh, China and India are, have the worst deaths, death rate for air pollution, mainly because they burn so much coal in, to generate the electricity they need. Um, 
I don't know if anybody has been to China. Uh, my wife was there uh, probably about five, six years ago, and uh, she said it was pretty much like this most of the time. Um, frightening picture here. This was actually taken in 2017, and this woman is wearing a mask then. Uh, this is in uh, Poland, Warsaw, Poland. Uh, because of the quality of the air there is so bad, they're saying that uh, an infant uh, in its first year is uh, inhaling the equivalent of a thousand cigarettes based on the pollution there. Coal burning power also uh, in, uh, distributes, uh, emits uh, mercury into the atmosphere, which again is, is very bad for humans and animals and other things. Uh, so we are now also seeing the uh, extinction of a lot of species, plants, insects, birds, other animals. We hear about this a lot if people are in that space. I'm sure, Jeff, you are very familiar with the devastation of, uh, across the board of uh, the loss of these. And again, nature, all this stuff is interrelated, so the loss of one species impacts others. Um, so again, this is a little, uh, this, this sound here will wake up the forest this year. <laughs> So, as, as I mentioned, again, the focus of the uh, Climate Reality Project is very much what can we do to uh, reduce fossil fuels. So, uh, again, the emitter of uh, major carbon throughout the world. So we've kind of run through a lot of these issues. It, there are a lot of interrelated issues. There's social justice issues as well. Um, we'll save that for another uh, presentation. But we're basically trying to get back to about a 350 parts per million which based on where we are right now is uh, mind boggling. Um, so if we can do that over the next decade or so, we might have, we might have an opportunity to uh, stabilize and maybe reverse some of this uh, uh, negative, these negative aspects that we've just reviewed. We have, we basically know that uh, most of the world can generate their uh, electrical needs with solar and wind. Uh, in fact, in some areas, it's, it is much cheaper to generate via solar or wind than uh, fossil fuels. We know that the oil industry has a, a pretty uh, big stranglehold on what we do and how we do things, uh, but I think we're seeing that changing as well. So wind energy, back in 2000, the projection was that we might reach 30 gigawatts by 2010. Uh, we basically exceeded that goal by 2019 by 22 times. Uh, so again, wind energy capacity is ever increasing. Uh, this is mostly onshore, uh, onshore, not offshore, onshore meaning on land, uh, wind generation. Uh, Germany and other uh, European countries have really uh, invested heavily in wind energy uh, and, and again that enables them to phase out uh, fossil fuel production. Um, we do, uh, we are doing quite a bit here in, in, uh, in the states for wind producing, uh, wind production. Kansas actually gets about 36 percent of its electricity from wind turbines uh, but the actual major uh, installations are actually in Texas, uh, believe it or not which are competing with the, the oil industry there. Uh, so they have the most capacity of uh, wind turbines installed. And we're seeing more even in Massachusetts. It's always nice to go down to the Cape and uh, cross the bridge and see those, uh, I think there's four turbines there now. Again, solar is the same thing. Back in 2002, the projection that we grow maybe by one gigawatt per year. Uh, we actually grew in those eight years uh, by a factor of 17, and by 2019 we exceeded it by 121 percent, or 121 times, sorry. Uh, again, worldwide solar uh, installations are uh, ever increasing. Um, again, the cost of uh, solar cells continues to decline. Uh, this slide is kind of interesting when I first 
came across it because 1976 was when we started our office uh, in Ashland. Uh, and at that time, we actually were working on a few uh, so passive solar and active solar homes uh, for some people in the, mostly in, kind of in the Sherburne, Framingham area that had a kind of a focus on sustainability. I did not know that that's what they were paying per watt for their panels, uh, but now in 2020, we're down about 20 cents a watt for installed uh, solar cells. Uh, Chile has uh, invested heavily in solar, uh, as demonstrated by this chart, which is basically goes off the chart, um, and they have a real commitment to close their coal-fired plants and continue to invest in uh, solar. California, again, where you have sunshine most of the time, unlike uh, here, where we're only about half, half the time, uh, is investing heavily in solar uh, and are able, things like this happen, they'll be able to demolish this gas-fired plant 20 years ahead of schedule because they can now generate electricity cheaper uh, via wind and solar. Uh, there is a coal mining museum in uh, Benham, Kentucky, as there should be. Um, but it is powered by solar panels. A little whimsy there. So again, the intent is to, re to retire all of our coal-fired plants. Uh, the, this year, they're expecting to retire an additional 30 gigawatts of generating capacity and also add uh, about 186 gigawatts of solar and wind. The interesting uh, slide here is that as you levelize the cost of energy production um, based on the long-term costs, and again, nuclear is the most expensive because those plants are the most expensive to build, but you also have a long-term uh, issue of dealing with the radioactive waste. Uh, but both coal and gas are still, right now, are now, have become more expensive than solar and wind. And, and perhaps people have seen this before, but or heard this before, uh, for the years, uh, again, every hour, we get enough solar energy to power the world for a year. Again, storage is, uh, you know, lithium battery uh, technology is uh, getting better all the time. Uh, we have certainly the commitment from many companies now, the car companies, that are finally advertising and moving to uh, electric cars. Uh, it's great, great to see. Uh, a lot of uh, transportation companies are moving to uh, uh, electric buses. We see the ads for Amazon uh, looking to buy, uh, ordering 100,000 electric uh, delivery vehicles. It seems like all 100,000 are usually in Milford, but uh, uh, that's a good thing. Uh, electric cars on the road are ever increasing, and certainly we know that uh, we have now recommitted to the Paris <laughs> Accord. And as you maybe got the email this morning, the Biden Harris administration uh, renewed our commitment to the Accord, but they also issued today uh, their NDC goal of 50% reduction of emissions by 2030. That's over the 20, 2005. Uh, standards. More and more companies worldwide have made a commitment to go 100% renewable um, by usually 20, 2040, some are 2035, um, but again the fact that the, uh, they're making those commitments is encouraging. Uh, so we again have uh, moved to net zero emissions uh, legislation that Charlie Baker just uh, put into, finally approved after much uh, uh, pushing. Uh, we are looking to net zero emissions 50% by 2030 and 100% by 2050. This is for new construction and, and again increasing our renewable energy to 100% by 2047. <clears throat> you probably all know that Massachusetts has the dubious distinction of paying the highest cost for electricity in America, even more than Hawaii. So that's Scary. And Hawaii has a commitment to go 100% renewable, I think, within uh, 10, 10 or 12 years. 
Um, so it's happening. Uh, again, people will say too little, too late, but I say if you don't, you got to start somewhere, and if you don't start today, you're not going to get there. Uh, so one resource that I mentioned earlier uh, is the Drawdown, uh, and it's www.drawdown.org. I would highly recommend, if you're not familiar with that organization and that uh, group of uh, experts that are focusing on what are the solutions that are achievable and attainable to reverse global warming. Uh, they have done the research, they do the research every day, and it's a phenomenal resource online. It's searchable, and they basically have come up with ranking about 100 uh, criteria for effectiveness in what are you investing to reduce carbon and what is your return on that investment. And the top five, uh, interestingly, are refrigerant management, our air conditioning systems around the world are either uh, uh, operate at reduced efficiency, are using hazardous uh, refrigerants, uh, are obsolete, or again, just need to be upgraded uh, refrigerants need to be replaced with non -to less toxic or non-toxic refrigerants and the equipment just needs to be upgraded. Wind power is number two. If in fact we develop the wind power that we should be developing, uh, we will be uh, going a long way. Reduced food waste. In this country, statistics range anywhere from a third to a half of our food is wasted. Uh, which, again, we have an, it's an embarrassment of riches that we have here, that we enjoy in this country, uh, but it's, it's got to stop. Um, we waste more food than some countries, you know, that countries would use. Um, and it's worldwide, too. So that, number one, you start to reduce food waste, you reduce the need for that industrial agriculture, uh, and it goes down the line. Plant-rich diets, again, less or no meat, uh, industrial uh, raising of uh, animals for meat is uh, hugely uh, intensive in production of CO2 and methane, um, so we could all do with less of that. And again, the stuff that's being developed uh, as far as the quality and the taste for uh, plant-based food has really come a long way. Uh, and then tropical forest preservation is number five. So again, it goes into uh, the top 20. I don't have all of them here, but uh, again, an incredible resource. Uh, and a lot of it has to do with food more than energy. Um, so again, they've gone through the math and uh, the, what the investment is versus what uh, the return on that investment and to get to, again, a carbon, carbon neutral future. Quite a few organizations and resources. Again, you know, a lot of you go online to see this stuff, receive emails from a variety of organizations. Uh, 350.org, uh, Bill McKibben's uh, group that's been around for a long time. They have a very active group in Central Mass and in, and in, uh, in Worcester and in Metro West. Uh, good resources are Architecture 2030 and the 2030 Palette, which basically shows what's happening around the world in the world of design, construction, and infrastructure. Uh, Boston Living with Water, I mentioned earlier, um, and certainly there's other organizations that you may know of that I don't, uh, so it'd be good to share those. Um, and obviously things you can do. You, everybody knows these things, they've heard it um, before. Uh, again, reduce, recycle, and reuse has been a mantra for, for decades. The big thing is people don't do it. Uh, do not use single plastic, use plastics. Public transportation, again, you know, when we visit other countries, especially in Europe, and see the phenomenal public transportation systems they have, uh, or go to San Francisco, and you know, you don't need a car. Uh, there are some places that do have good public transportation. Unfortunately, uh, we live in an area that has not really developed that. Uh, eat less or no meat, compost all organics for your garden, um, solar panels, hybrid electric cars, uh, LED lighting, certainly that has now become the norm uh, and the energy savings there is uh, phenomenal. 
Uh, we start to I get information about the number of uh, buildings and the square footage that has been built, uh, but then the energy usage uh, it basically stays constant or actually declines because buildings are being built more uh, energy efficiently with better insulation systems and again we've converted to LED lighting. Anything we can do to use natural ventilation uh, and not turn on the air conditioning or the heat is good. Uh, and again, get involved with local groups and uh, talk to your legislators. Fortunately, we have Ed Markey here who's been spearheading this stuff for a long time. <clears throat> and again, we tip our hat to Greta Thunberg. Um, no one is too small to make a difference. And adults keep saying we owe it to the young people to keep to give them hope. But I don't want your hope. I want you to act as if your house is on fire. Because it is. So, world depends on it. Thanks. <laughs>